I'm Richard Stanford, and I have some books to share with you. Um, it's that year that we are sheltered by COVID, and uh, hopefully we'll be out of this pretty soon, but a wonderful thing we can do while we're experiencing sheltering and uh, being at home is to read. Uh, there are some fabulous books that have come out this year, and if you love history, uh, this, is, this is a significant year for those who love World War II. This is the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And there have been a bunch of books over the last three or four years as, as, uh, uh, as the, the, the 75th has gone along. Uh, but particularly here at the end, there are some bestsellers that are just magic. And I want to share some of those with you. The good part about it is you, you should have the time to read. Uh, and you don't need to go get them. You can have them online, drop on your porch. And so it's a great time to be reading. And so I want to introduce you to, to the ones that I think are fabulous World War II books. I want to start off with maybe the best seller of all of them, The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson. Uh, you know Eric Larson from Dead Wake and from uh, uh, Beast, uh, The Heart of the Beast and from Devil in the White City fabulous storyteller. Uh, the Splendid and the Vile is his story of Churchill and the Blitz. Um, and, and it's told in, in a great style. Uh, as you know, uh, the Germans attacked Poland, Britain declared war. Uh, so September 1939 began the war for Britain. We didn't enter it till Pearl Harbor in late 41. But 39, 40, 41, the Battle of the Atlantic as German U-boats sank British shipping. The Battle of Britain as British airmen went up to try to stop the Germans who could fly over Britain with impunity. Uh, it was a tough time and Britain stood alone. Uh, America was not yet ready to commit to any kind of war. Roosevelt would have sold uh, or given materials, but we weren't ready for that till a little bit later. And so Churchill takes over as Chamberlain resigns. Churchill takes over just in time uh, to, to oversee the evacuation at Dunkirk. 350,000 British troops uh, removed from France in private boats and small ships, uh, getting them back to England. It was a, it was a harrowing moment for the British. Uh, uh, but as soon as that was over, things got worse almost every place else. Uh, North Africa, uh, the British troops had to retreat before Erwin Rommel. Uh, Norway was lost. Uh, it was just a tough time. Churchill and his oratory and his grit uh, helped bring th Britain through. He hired Beaverbrook, who, uh, the, the, the newspaper magnate who basically got the war production going, particularly on airplanes. And uh, basically, this is the story of how Britain rearmed itself and came out of a very dark time but it's primarily a story of how Londoners endured the Blitz because um, Hitler wanted to take the British Isles. He was going to take it by an invasion. It was going to be Operation Sea Lord. Uh, they were going to invade the British Islands, but they had to loosen them up first uh, by repeated Luftwaffe bombings. So you sent bombers, fighter planes, bombers. The bombers worked off of radio beams so that they could, so that they could converge on various places to bomb. And the British uh, had a hard time defending against that, uh, but it was the war of horror against the British population in London uh, that gets the main part of this book going, and that is the Blitz, uh, living in the underground bunkers. During the day, the King and Queen and Churchill walking out in the east side and east London and, and, and being with those who had been bombed and killed, thousands killed, a terror by night. Um, but but basically, this story also talks a whole lot about Churchill and his family. Uh, Churchill spent a lot of time out at Checkers. It was a home that was uh, loaned to the, to the government uh, outside of London where he could meet with great leaders and plan uh, the defense of Britain. And so it's all about the Blitz. Uh, luckily, right about the middle of this book, all of a sudden, the British uh, get enough air power to play tit for tat and start bombing Berlin, which was a surprise to Hitler. Uh, they also are able to uh, um, begin to reverse the losses in, in North Africa, El Alamein and Montgomery, 
uh, they, they, they recapture the initiative in North Africa uh, and bit by bit, inch by inch, fight their way back and, and maybe the luckiest part of all for Britain and for ourselves, uh, Germany, uh, it was Hitler's project to attack Russia in, in 1941. And so all of a sudden Germany has an Eastern Front and they, they are unable to, to concentrate as much uh, manpower against Britain. As a result of the Luftwaffe being unable to take London uh, and Britain, there was no Operation Sea Lion and the British Isles survived. Uh, but all the suffering and all the horror of the, of the uh, blitz and, and life in the bunkers underground, um, bomb shelters, uh, is told vividly in this book. Um, uh, even, even later on, as Britain was beginning to take some offensive uh, action, uh, the Germans developed buzz bombs, V1s, at the end of the war, V2s, uh, that, that would come over London and then drop and destroy whole neighborhoods. And so uh, it's, a, it's a great story, well told, and I would recommend The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson as one of your first picks to read uh, during this time. Uh, the next couple of books take place in 1943, and uh, one of them is a British operation. If you've seen the movie The Damn Busters, it's based on an early 50s book of that name, uh, the movie with Richard Todd in the mid-50s. Uh, it, is, it is a glorious World War II story for the British, particularly. Um, what it does is tell the story of how they developed the ability uh, to bomb the great German dams on the Ruhr River, to, to flood the Ruhr Valley and to destroy German war production. Um, interesting story because uh, it, a very complex problem is involved with, with bombing the, the German dams. Uh, in this case, the dams were the Mona and the Eder and the Sorpe. Uh, the Sorpa was a, an earthen dam. The, the, the Mona and the Eder were, were, uh, were, were built. And, and uh, um, so how, how, do you, how do you bomb them? They're, they're sort of up in the hills. It's hard to get these big bombers in. Uh, what you're going to have to use is a Lancaster bomber, big old British bomber, a uh, seven-man bomber. Uh, and how are you going to get in? get in front of the dams, drop the bombs, blow the dams, and get out of there uh, without losing all your airplanes. Um, there was a scientist named Barnes Wallace. He came up with some ideas. They were put before Bomber Harris, Arthur Harris, who was head of the, uh, uh, the uh, bomb, bomb Command and, and the Bomber Command, and, and uh, Harris didn't like it because Harris loved mass bombing, these huge night bombings, uh, the British would bomb at night, the Americans during the day, uh, bombing the German cities. Uh, it was pretty brutal and he preferred that to, to a, a raid like this proposed raid on the Ruhr dams. Uh, but bit by bit, Barnes Wallace was able to produce um, a, a workable plan. They tried it out. This is the complexity. Uh, and it's so well told in this book. Operation Chastise is written by uh, uh, one of, one of uh, Britain's better military historians, Max Hastings, and it tells that story. But the, the difficulty is uh, how do you get the bombs to blow up the dams? You can't just drop them right on top of the dam. It needs to be at the bottom to crack, break the dam and let the water pressure destroy it and, and the floods begin. Um, he developed the bouncing bomb. And the, the story's told in this book of how the bouncing bomb was developed. It had to be dropped from a very low altitude, bounce without breaking, bounce, 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 hit the dam, sink down to the bottom of the dam, and then blow. So how are you going to do that at night uh, in, in a mountainous terrain uh, with, with dams that are defended on both sides by gun emplacements that try to shoot you down? And so that was the tough part. And this, this tells the amazing story. The movie does too, but this tells in a whole lot more detail uh, the, the amazing story of how you basically uh, develop systems where you know exactly the height to be at, exactly the number of yards from the dam to drop the bomb. 
Uh, and another another interesting part of the bomb was was uh, uh, it had to it had to be spun. They had calipers inside these uh, Lancasters spinning these bombs until they were dropped. Um, and so, uh, how they developed the lighting system, the triangulation, how they dropped the bombs, uh, and how the raid finally worked out uh, is gripping. Uh, another thing that uh, another thing that. Uh, you need to keep in mind is it's one thing to drop bombs it's another thing to get to the place where you drop bombs and to get back again and a great deal of this story is told uh, from the perspective of how you get there and get back they lost eight of their 19 airplanes uh, in the raid on those dams uh, that's 56 pilots uh, but uh, you know it was successful what happened was the eight air uh, was breached, the Mona was breached, the Sorpa was not, the Earthen Dam did not give in to the bombing, uh, but the Ader and the, uh, particularly the Mona, uh, when they collapsed, uh, uh, flooded the Ruhr Valley. There's, there's an element of tragedy in this because a lot of the Ruhr Valley contained a lot of slave workers from Eastern Europe who were drowned. They were slaves of the Germans. But, uh, and, and the other bad part, I guess, of all of this was uh, under Albert Speer, they were, uh, the Germans were able to uh, reconstruct uh, in fairly quick order but this raid was a great morale booster a huge morale booster but but getting there and getting back was was a was a big issue um, because you were flying so low you were flying at treetops you were uh, buzzing above power lines uh, you were so low so that you did not get shot down and you were also going over German emplacements uh, at several places along the way. And they lost several airplanes coming and going. Now, um, I want to read, uh, want to read a, uh, a piece from, from Operation Chastise just to give you an idea of, of how, this, how this author writes. Uh, Warship or tank crews lived and fought amid familiar environments and a relatively even tenor of discomfort. A unique aspect of the bomber war was that Harris's air crews spent most of their flying careers deep in the English countryside, drinking on stand downs in local pubs or dance halls such as the Gilderdrome in Boston. Then every few nights they were plunged into the hottest flame of battle over Germany. The revolving door between relative tranquility and desperate peril, parallel existences in violently contrasting environments imposed a special kind of strain. Can you imagine uh, being at a bar in in Boston in England, uh, drinking and knowing that the, the the next day you would have to go over Germany with all the horror of bombing Germany, uh, bomber bases were desolate places as observed by Henry Treese. Expanses of grass, concrete huts, hangars occupied by a permanent population of up to 1,500 ground crew, administrators, parachute packers, mess staff, service police, fire teams, armorers, medics. Officers, batmen, bet you didn't know there were that many people involved, uh, who enjoyed the privilege of relatively safe, if austere, wartime existences. They often worked hard in all weathers, but were overwhelmingly likely to survive. Their functions were to support 300 odd birds of passage from two squadrons who were likely to die. The flyers might spend seven or eight months at a given station, but would, would more plausibly vanish over Germany some night or another. In the spring of 1943, less than one man in five was completing a 30-trip tour of operations, and only 2.5% finished a second tour. No crew is recorded as having offered to Sir Arthur Harris, uh, the bomber Harris, the old Roman gladiator's farewell to the emperor, Morturi uh, to Salatamus, we who are about to die salute you, but that was the way things were. Statistically, wartime British and American soldiers and sailors enjoyed odds heavily weighted in favor of coming through, while in 1943, the adverse prospects of bomber boys were matched only by those of submarine crews. A personal testimony, I am named after my uncle who was killed after, in his B-24 after flying just a few missions, having been in the air only about a month and a half before he and his entire crew were killed bombing the Romanian oil fields. It was brutal work. And so 
the success of Operation Chastise, uh, it, it was one of those great um, morale-lifting British exercises that let them know that they could strike the Germans where it hurt. Uh, and the story of how they came up with this amazing system of doing this and how it was carried out is a real thriller. And so I would highly recommend Operation Chastise, the RAF's most brilliant attack of World War II by Max Hastings. A little, uh, just a few months later, a little bit later in the summer, the Americans uh, had a great morale building uh, uh, raid by air that's, that's uh, dead reckoning tells that story. The story of how Johnny Mitchell and his fighter pilots took on Admiral Yamamoto and avenged Pearl Harbor by Dick Lair. Uh, these are all brand new books just within the last few months, so I, I would recommend that you, you take a look at the ones that sound good to you. All of them sounded good to me. I read them all, reviewed them all, I love them all, and that's why I'm recommending them to you. Uh, now, um, Admiral Yamamoto uh, was the head of the Japanese Navy. He was well uh, versed in, in America and things American. He had served as a naval attache here. Uh, he had been all over the United States. Ironically, he was a man that knew how strong America was, and he was not of the war party, not of, Admiral, uh, not of General Tojo's party. Uh, he did not believe a war was advisable. He didn't even like the Germans. He had a chance to meet Hitler and, and wouldn't do it. Uh, he was opposed to the tripartite agreement between uh, uh, Italy and Germany and Japan, where they all pledged to protect each other in the event of war. Uh, he was against that, um, but he had to do what the war party insisted upon. Uh, and so he was the planner of Pearl Harbor. His intent was to hit the U.S. so hard uh, that, we would, that we would basically be um, so discouraged that we would, uh, that, that we would not uh, uh, retaliate or, or fight a war. We would just make a peace. Uh, they so misunderstood the character of American, uh, uh, American character at that point in time. But, but anyway, that was, that was Admiral Yamamoto, and Yamamoto was a disciple of, of uh, Billy Mitchell, the American uh, military man who was the foremost advocate for uh, using airplanes taken off of ships, use, use of carriers and carrier-based airplanes. And so that was Yamamoto's specialty also. Uh, he planned Pearl Harbor, and so therefore he was the villain in American eyes uh, as the architect of Pearl Harbor. They made a lot of mistakes at Pearl Harbor, as you know. They didn't bomb the fuel depots. The carriers were out at sea and not in the harbor. Uh, they, they didn't take out the parts supply areas. They made mistakes that, that cost them later. But early in the war, after Pearl Harbor, uh, we were crippled and we lost, uh, uh, we lost uh, and had to basically withdraw from the Philippines, Bataan, Corregidor, you know all that story. Uh, but it's amazing how quick the United States comes back and that story is well told in Dead Reckoning. Uh, we come back, uh, Coral Sea was brutal uh, but it, it was somewhat of a draw, but we could hold our own as early as Coral Sea. The Doolittle Raiders in 1942 attacked Tokyo and bombed Tokyo. It was a token measure, but it was a great morale booster for the Americans, and that story is told also. Uh, but we had one thing that was crucial to the war that people don't realize. We knew the Japanese code. We had broken their codes, and, and this book tells the story of how those codes were broken and, and what code breaking looks like uh, in great detail and it makes it very fascinating if you're interested in that. Uh, so we knew their codes uh, and we knew where certain ships were to be during the Battle of the Coral Sea and that's how come we held our own. We certainly knew by the time of Midway uh, what the plans were. They didn't know that we knew at Midway. Uh, one of the great interesting stories that's told in this book, uh, AF in the Japanese code, what's AF? They, they want to take AF, what's AF? Uh, and so we send out a little message that says, uh, we, have, uh, we have water desalinization plant problems on Midway. And then 
we decode one of their messages that says water problem on AF and we know what they're after. And so the Japanese never quite knew that we knew their codes and that was so important at Coral Sea, it was so important uh, at Midway. And uh, so after Midway, uh, our, our war was two-pronged. It came from the south under MacArthur through uh, uh, the, the New Guinea in that area came through the middle Pacific island hopping under Admiral Nimitz uh, and basically we were converging on Tokyo at some point uh, but the plan was hatched that that maybe maybe we should shoot down Admiral Yamamoto that would be a great morale booster for us and a great morale destroyer for them uh, and we knew the codes, and they didn't know we knew the codes. And Admiral Yamamoto was a great um, organized, um, very timely uh, person on time schedules. He was very precise. And so when they finally got a message, a series of messages that convinced them that Admiral Yamamoto was going to make a morale tour from Rabul into Bougainville and, and, and hit various, stop at various bases, uh, they knew it was the opportunity to shoot down Admiral Yamamoto. Now, assassinating a, a military leader of an enemy is a tricky thing, but it went all the way to the top to Admiral Nimitz, and he basically authorized uh, the, the shooting down of Yamamoto if we could do it. But deciding to shoot down and shooting down are two very different things. Uh, we basically... Um, uh, knew that he was going to be at Bougainville at this hour and fly from here to there. And, uh, but our planes were at Guadalcanal. A, a, a crew had been assembled. Just as a crew was assembled in Operation Chastised by the British, the British had Guy Gibson and a lot of really great pilots and bombers. Uh, so it was for, for our, ourselves, our pilots were hand-chosen, uh, Johnny Mitchell and Rex Barber and Tom Lamphere. Uh, and, and quite a few others. Uh, they were flying P-38s, but P-38s weren't as uh, maneuverable and, and zeros, could, zeros could, could take a P-38 fairly easily. But P-39s were coming out and that was a whole different matter. And so these guys began training on P-39s when they came out at Guadalcanal. The, the great story of Guadalcanal is also told, again, in Dead Reckoning, the story of Guadalcanal and all the ugliness of the land war, the sea war, all that went on, the slog that was Guadalcanal. But these guys were practicing, uh, practicing their aerial skills out of Guadalcanal, and basically uh, they, they, uh, they had a problem, though, once they were ready. They knew the dates, the times, everything else. But this was up at Bougainville. This was hundreds of miles away across open ocean. They couldn't fly over Japanese occupied land. That's the name of the title of this book comes from that, Dead Reckoning, because they literally had to dead reckon. Uh, they had to fly very low out over the open ocean, dead reckoning using, using their computational skills and their timepieces and all of that to figure out when how to get to Bougainville without ever seeing land, <laughs> and then once they were at Bougainville to hit it at a certain hour when Admiral Yamamoto would be in the air. And you know, they did it. And that's, that's the fun part of this book is watching as they do that, um, uh, how they do that. Uh, when they get to Bougainville, uh, they had expected a, Betty, a, a Japanese Betty bomber uh, surrounded by six zeros, according to the decoded message. The only problem was when they got there on time, everybody was on time, but there were two Betty bombers. And so the question became, which one was Yamamoto in? Uh, a decision was made, it was the right decision, they picked the right airplane, uh, and then they began tussling with the zeros and, and firing into the bombers. And, and uh, uh, what ultimately happened was Admiral Yamamoto was shot down and killed. I want to read uh, from, from uh, Dead Reckoning a piece. Uh, Johnny Mitchell continued his ascent, turned slightly to the right in order to fly parallel to Yamamoto in the same direction along Bougainville's coastline. His squadron in tight formation now 
followed closely behind. There was no time to think about anything other than the task at hand. Uh, they were closing in on Yamamoto quickly. It was Rex Barber that shot him down. For years, Rex Barber and Tom Lamphere uh, debated over who shot him down, but it was Barber. Barber was so close now that he could see the bomber's rear cannon and realize no one was manning it, which explained why he wasn't receiving any fire. And as he centered his fire on the fuselage one more time, the bomber suddenly seemed to stop in midair as if stalled. The plane rolled slightly to the left, a quarter snap. Barber nearly collided with it, barely missing the upturned wing as he flew past and over the bomber in a flash. He saw the bomber level off while continuing to drop less than 100 yards now from the tops of the trees, and that was all he saw. Now, no longer could he see the Betty bomber, which headed overland in the direction of, of Buin, but would never come close to reaching its destination. The plane, engulfed in flames, brushed the jungle canopy before plunging into it, the left wing ripped off by treetops. Upon impact, it exploded into flames, broke up, the biggest chunks being the tail assembly, engines, and parts of the wings. The 11 men on board were hurled in every direction, all but one burned beyond recognition. The 11th passenger was propelled clear of the wreck, still strapped upright in the brush, dressed in a green khaki uniform, metal ribbons on his chest, his hands in white gloves. The left hand clutched a sword. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto was a picture of repose, except that he wasn't resting. He was dead. So that was the shooting down of Yamamoto, great American morale booster. The Japanese did not talk about it for a couple of weeks. It was, it was a huge morale destroyer for the Japanese and, and, uh, um, and was one of, the great, uh, one of the great raids of the war uh, was, the sh was the shooting down of Yamamoto, told very well in Dead Reckoning by Dick Lair. And now the final book that I want to talk about is uh, Chris Wallace um, of Fox News. Uh, Chris has written Countdown 1945. It's the last of these books to come out just within the last few weeks. The Extraordinary Story of the Atomic Bomb and the 116 Days that Changed the World. Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but Harry Truman um, uh, was sitting in the, in the cloakroom of the Senate uh, on April 12th of 1945, just minding his own business. I think he was maybe talking with Sam Rayburn. And Steve Early, uh, the president's aide, called from the White House and said he had to come over right now. Truman thought he might be in trouble. He'd only met with Roosevelt a couple times. He'd, uh, they, they'd really talked very little. Uh, and and uh, so he was afraid he'd done something that made President Roosevelt mad. Uh, so he hurried over to the White House. When he got there, he knew something was wrong. Eleanor Roosevelt and, uh, and, and their daughter Anna were standing there in, in black, and, and Eleanor said that the president had died suddenly. Uh, he asked if he could help her, and she says, no, Harry, you're the one that needs help. How can we help you? Uh, he did not know. Vice President of the United States did not know about the work on the atomic bomb that was ongoing. Uh, over the next few days, before he went... For, for a big meeting with, with Churchill and Stalin at Potsdam to figure out how to end the war. Uh, before that, he received his first briefings on the atomic bomb project. Um, Los Alamos in New Mexico, Oak Ridge in Tennessee, the Hanford facility in Washington, the University of Chicago's uh, in, in, in Chicago, all places where various components and programs of the atomic bomb uh, program were going on. Uh, maybe, maybe the largest of all, or certainly the most crucial, was Los Alamos. Uh, that's where Robert Oppenheimer, the scientist, and Leslie Groves, the, the uh, Army general, uh, ran the program, uh, very top secret, uh, that was developing the atomic bomb. It was not a hard choice for Harry Truman uh, when he was told uh, that th this bomb could kill so many. Uh, he was a man that made decisions pretty quickly and, and he came to the conclusion that American lives would be saved, even Japanese lives would be saved by dropping these bombs if they did not surrender. Uh, the, the predictions he was getting from the American brass were that uh, half, a, uh, maybe as many, many as a half a million 
American troops would be uh, killed or wounded in taking the Japanese homelands and probably millions of Japanese. Unfortunately, from early that, uh, early that spring, really beginning of February, January, February, uh, we had been firebombing Tokyo. Uh, General LeMay's uh, uh, planes had been firebombing Tokyo. 900,000 Japanese were killed in that spring offensive. Um, too bad, but we did not know whether that bomb would work. And so nobody knew whether that bomb would work. And this tells the gripping story of the uncertainties as we planned uh, where we would drop a bomb, if we were going to drop a bomb, if it worked, uh, and the work of the scientists to tr try to develop that bomb, at Oak, particularly at, at uh, Los Alamos. Uh, and, and basically it tells the story of what happened on July 16th of 1945 when the first atomic bomb test was made at the Trinity site in, in a very isolated part of New Mexico. It went perfectly. Truman received the message while he was at Potsdam. He felt he needed to pass that message on to Churchill and on to Stalin. Uh, now, what he didn't know when Stalin showed a, a, great, a great amount of uh, interest in, in it but didn't seem all that surprised, uh, Stalin was not surprised because Stalin already knew. There was a man named Klaus Fuchs, a Soviet spy who was in, embedded at Los Alamos and sending messages to the Soviets at, at all times about what was being done at Los Alamos. But Truman shared that message and, and basically um, um, decided uh, that we needed to forge forward. Plans were made. A crew, again, the crew is always so important. When Operation Chastise, we talked about Guy Gibson and all those great pilots that served with him uh, in, in Dead Reckoning, uh, the Yamamoto raid. Uh, all the great guys that served with Johnny Mitchell and Rex Barber and Tom Lamphere. Same thing with, with the, the atomic bomb. Uh, basically, a crew was assembled. It, it was already assembled, waiting for something that they didn't know what it was. Uh, but that, that basic, uh, that basic uh, uh, group of pilots under Paul Tibbetts, famous American pilot, he flew the Enola Gay, the lead plane on the bombing raid over Hiroshima. Uh, this tells the story of how they were transferred to the island of Tinian, which we had taken in battle from the Japanese, built a huge air base. That's where we were bombing Tokyo out of. That's where the bombers would, would take the atomic bomb uh, and drop it uh, over, over Hiroshima. Hiroshima was picked. Uh, Kokura was picked. Kokura was scrapped the day it was supposed to happen because the weather was bad and the bomb was dropped on the alternative site, Nagasaki. Um, but this tells the story of how they trained. Again, you have to have a plane that's specially armed, that, uh, and it's so dangerous, you've got an atomic bomb on board. Uh, and so they didn't actually arm that weapon until they were in the air. If it had crashed on Tinian, it would have obliterated Tinian. And so they had to take off and arm it in the air. Uh, so basically, um, this tells the story of how those crews trained, uh, how, how the bomb was developed, all, the, all the, the, the ways that it had to be decided. Because after all, uh, if you were too close to the bomb you dropped when it ignited midway down in the air, uh, you would be destroyed too. And so it was a very dangerous mission. Uh, but you know what happened at Hiroshima? Um, and basically, the Japanese were not willing to surrender even after that for a few days. Uh, that story that we now know about all the internal dissensions in the Japanese high command uh, was told in a wonderful book called uh, 14 Days in August a while back. But once the Nagasaki bomb was dropped, the Japanese surrendered, and that was the end of the war. Uh, we debate yet whether or not it was the right thing to do, but I think most people never, or like Harry Truman, they never debate whether it was the right thing to do. Uh, there would have been two, three million people killed in the invasion, most of them Japanese, but maybe half a million of them American in the invasion of the Japanese home islands. So uh, there were a couple hundred thousand, uh, between 150 and 200,000 killed in the, in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki raids. I'm going to do one reading and then we'll We'll leave it to you to order whichever of these books or all of them, if you're wise, that you want to read. I, I want to read what it was like in, uh, in the briefing room 
before, before the pilots left to bomb Hiroshima. This is the briefing. The bomb you're going to drop is something new in the history of warfare, he said, the briefer. It's the most destructive weapon ever produced. We think it will knock out almost everything within a three-mile area. The crews were stunned. They wondered if they'd heard the man correctly. The words atomic bomb were never used, but uh, they had been given the Reader's Digest version of the entire Manhattan Project. No one knows what will happen when the bomb is dropped from the air. This has never been done before, he said, turning to a blackboard. He drew a mushroom cloud, then turned to the men. He said they expected a cloud in the shape of a mushroom to arise at, at least 30,000 feet, preceded by a flash of light much brighter than the sun. The flight crews shifted on their benches. didn't take a genius to figure out that they would all be well within the reach of the explosion and the mushroom cloud. One of the intelligence officers pulled out a pair of tinted goggles, similar to ones worn by welders. Parsons explained that every crew member on planes near the target would have to wear them at the time of the explosion. The effects of the blast, the shock waves, and radiation were still unknown, he said. To reduce the risk, Tibbet's plane would fly alone over the target. The shock waves might cripple or even destroy the plane. No one could say for sure. And what'll happen to the crew? They couldn't help but wonder, is this a suicide mission? Tibbets, Tibbets said he was proud of them having worked so hard for so long on an unknown mission. Now if things went according to plan, their work would cut short the war and save thousands of lives. Whatever work we've done up to now is small potatoes compared to what we're about to do, he said. The men went silently out into the bright afternoon, wondering, worrying, and marveling. There were so many things that could have gone wrong including the bombs themselves. The bombs were taken to the island of Tinian, both Little Boy and Fat Man. Both bombs were taken to Tinian on board the USS Indianapolis through enemy waters. It was not sunk. After it dropped the bombs on Tinian on the way back, it was sunk, one of the great naval tragedies of the Second World War. So uh, a lot of luck, a lot of planning, and, and some glorious some glorious results for morale for the Americans and the British in all four of these books. So let me put them in front of you again. Uh, Countdown 1945 by Chris Wallace. Dead Reckoning by Dick Lair. The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson. And Operation Chastise by Max Hastings. Uh, if you want to read them all back to back, it'll take you a couple, two or three weeks, but you'll love every minute of it. I highly recommend it. Now's the time to do it if you, if you love history and if you want to properly celebrate uh, the end of the Second World War 75 years later. Thank you.